Thank you very much, uh, President. And first of all, I want to congratulate you on your new appointment yourself, Willie, uh, as President of WIT, and to wish you every success in your new role. You have so many hat hats on now. I only put on a hat to make sure that people know that I had some hair one time. Uh, but you have so many hats, I don't know how you keep it all done. But it's, it's great to be here amongst uh, people that are very, uh, of course, the, the very involved in agri-tech and the agri-business. And uh, I suppose it's great to be in Kilkenny Castle, uh, one of my native county's crown jewels. And I'm proud to say one of Ireland's finest heritage attractions. And in these historic walls, of course, where traces of the past are all around, some of it you wouldn't wish to talk about. But uh, I suppose uh, I wish to paint a picture for you for the future, rather than looking at the walls of the past, a future where we have people here today who are talking about innovation, research, collaboration, and the intelligent harnessing of technology and the potential it has for agriculture. And uh, indeed, this castle itself is no stranger to innovation. You should be aware it was the first OPW site in the country to have its own phone app, iPhone app which I launched in 2011, of course. All good things happen when I'm around. <laughs> Not everyone would agree with that, of course. But anyway, today we will discuss the big picture, and uh, we hopefully examine the very exciting opportunities for the agri-food and the agri-tech sector to deliver more solutions, more food, and more wealth. And the first time I was introduced to the word innovation and research was Willie Donnelly, and the second person I was introduced to was Gerald Keenan, when I was trying to open a few doors with Jim Green in China, and, uh, I, you know, as we said, it would be slow. <laughs> and it, you have to have great patience when you're in the Far East. Uh, but I, I want to maybe use the opportunity to provide some background and overview to the global agricultural context. As you know, worldwide demand and high-quality food will continue to increase, particularly in the emerging markets of Asia and Africa. Each year until 2030, at least 150 million people will be entering the global middle class. And this massive growth in disposable income uh, results in significant changes to dietary patterns. And to give just one example, global demand for dairy products is, is projected to increase at an annual rate of 2%. And with the recent end of milk quarters, Ireland is best placed and well placed to meet some of that demand. Europe has recognised the changing global patterns and has acted decisively in recent years to target supports where they are needed. And the common agricultural policy has moved from a system of price support with a heavily protected market to a market-orientated approach in the sector. We've broken the link between subsidies and production so that farmers and agribusiness look to the market rather than to Brussels when they decide what they will produce. As a result, we have a modern, more competitive sector, and we've seen considerable interest in investment and innovation as the sector is moving forward. And my ob objective as Commissioner is to ensure that EU agriculture continues to play a key role in satisfying global food demand and ensuring, that food, ensuring food security by enhancing the comp overall competitiveness of our agri-food sector. But we cannot lose sight, of course, of the environmental imperatives that underpin these changes. And in that regard, I want to congratulate Joe Crockett, who at the time, uh, some years ago, when Har Food Harvest 2020 was in gestation, he brought together all of the players in the southeast, including the Environmental Protection Agency, the local authorities, and the key stakeholders, to reflect on the environmental challenges associated with meeting our objectives under Food Harvest 2020. And indeed, I, I read in the papers yesterday about the uh, fact that the huge expansion that New Zealand carried on over the last 30 years has resulted in some environmental problems. And we don't want to go down the same track and to be able to have a big bill at the end of the 30-year period to the value of about 11.5 billion euro, which the New Zealand authorities now have to find in order to deal with the environmental difficulties that has resulted in expanding without taking account of sustainability or without taking account of the environmental criteria. So we're facing an issue, uh, the fashionable phrase that I've become more accustomed to now is producing more, using less, whatever that means. But we're therefore compelled anyway to concentrate on the notion of producing more with the same amount of land, uh, with higher yields, and taking account of the environmental constraints that we're working within. So we're looking at the issue of the no, a new buzzword is called sustainable intensification. That was a big word in my was growing up in Tullerone. Uh, but anyway, you learn a lot of things as you go along. But you, it's very familiar, of course, now. This is the new buzz phrase for sustainable intensification. So we have to look at it in the context of land management, rotational grazing and soil conservation, 
pest management, nutrient management, crop diversity and water conservation. All of these issues now are becoming centre stage. It's not, you're not just going out to bring in the cows anymore in the morning or feed the cattle. You have to look at all of the, these issues in the round. And the ICT sector is going to play a transformative role uh, in addressing some of the solutions to these particular issues and, and, and apparent difficulties that, that we might have on these issues at the moment. And from a European point of view, we've, we have uh, developed some policy consistency to our to this particular matter by establishing a specific unit for the purposes of research. Uh, and it's the EIP. Uh, it's set up for the purpose of working with Horizon 2020 and with the Commissioner on Research to roll out some of the initiatives under Horizon 2020 that's uh, going to assist you, hopefully, in developing it in the future. And that's why I was very pleased that Commissioner Moedas was able to come to Ireland recently uh, in the last couple of weeks and that we were able to develop a lot of ideas and linkages and let him see some of the good work that's going on right around the country uh, with the help of Chagas and Science Foundation Ireland and Lanbia in the private sector and UCD and Moore Park. Like it, it was a, a tremendous day and he's still talking about it, which is always a good sign. And collaboration is how that added value can be achieved. So when you see uh, you know, a conversation that we have started here today, probably started a while ago, but brought together today by all the players in the public and private sector, all of the research and third level education facilities involved, local authorities, that we come together to see what is the objective and how can we work together to achieve that objective. So it means doing something that I have always subscribed to, removing the silos and thinking outside the silo. And that's not an easy thing for, some, for agencies or government departments or people over the years where they feel that they're in competition to each other. We're not in competition with each other. Everybody gets a spin out of actually breaking down the silo, silos and eventually uh, achieving an objective. And breaking down the silo man mentality is what I've been trying to do as Commissioner on Agriculture in my first six months, and that's what the Juncker Commission is trying to do. So we need collaboration and synergy. And it's for this reason that the, uh, the EU research, science and innovation uh, sector is equally as important as the EU Commission on Agriculture and Rural Development. And uh, the collaborative mindset, in my view, should permeate all aspects of the brave new world and the flow from laboratory to business to farm is apparent and essential. And for these reasons, I want to take this opportunity explicitly to encourage, to support, and to endorse this model and this initiative that you are presenting here today. Uh, and it presents an exemplary model of cooperation between TSSG, Intel, Lanbia, Chagas, Keenans, to name but a few. So I wish you every success in what you're trying to do. Uh, I, I know that when I went down to see Ed, Edmund Harty in Dairymaster uh, in, in July, he, he, he grabbed me very quickly because he had a little connection with me to get a few photographs before I was even a commissioner. But I, to see when you come out of Causeway, this massive entity of agricultural engineering you know, in, in a rural area was certainly breathtaking. First thing I asked him how he got planning permission. <laughs> uh, anyway. There's 350 working in it, that's all I was interested in. Uh, but there was a can-do attitude, obviously, in Kerry as well. Uh, but this is, the time. when you go around the, the European Union and you, hear, you see the, the brand names now that have become synonymous with agricultural engineering uh, and agricultural innovation already in some of the key sectors in Ireland, it's really gratifying for me. So congratulations on, on, on being coming, not just European leaders, but hopefully world leaders in your, in your sector in the years ahead. But we want to, I want to be there to help. Uh, Europe, of course, is there to help, but I have one eye in Ireland and uh, two eyes around Europe. And I want to encourage you, uh, with the 3.6 billion euro that we have to spend over the next four or five years, uh, that you are able to get some of the action. And uh, this is where Willie Donnelly is an expert, uh, because he knows where all the bodies are bur buried, with the help of Mark Ferguson, in order to extract as much money out of the European systems as he possibly can. And, and if, we, if you don't know, well, if you ask, we'll try and help you. Uh, and I uh, make no apologies about that, no matter what member state I go in. Uh, it just, this just happens to be the first one I'm talking about research and innovation. But certainly Horizon 2020 is a new element in, in the offering uh, for uh, agri-tech. I'll give you a recent example of where Chagas, the, the project landmark, was selected for funding following the first list of calls on the Horizon 2020 funding. And it touched upon most uh, the relevant aspects of soil management and was identified by experts as the best proposal submitted in the soil function category. So that's concrete innovation projects can be funded as well under the Rural Development Programme. 
and, uh, and Ireland has decided to take up the, you know, the EIP approach that I mentioned earlier in its rural development programme, and that can be co-financed under the Common Agricultural Policy. And uh, we want to help and intensify our networking between science and practice to spread out the good word about the fact that this particular exists. Another innovation that we've been working at for the last few months is to recognise that there's a problem in terms of access to finance and credit. You know, the pillar banks have gone through an enormous difficult time in Ireland, more than anywhere else. So it's hard to expect that they're going to recover overnight. It's hard to expect that they're going to have a, a sizable amount of money to put into maybe potential risky investments as far as they're concerned. Uh, but at the, at the same time, uh, it has to be done. So I've, we approached the European Investment Bank and developed a memorandum of understanding with them and succeeded in tailoring a fund uh, and setting up a guarantee fund around a, financial, a new financial instrument. Uh, and the National Treasury Management Agency are interested here in, in this particular new concept. Where it, what it means is uh, if you do put some of your rural development money into a guarantee fund, you can leverage a multiplier of five times that in soft loans. So you get longer term loans, you get access to a cheap source of money, and you leverage more money for rural development than you would have otherwise. And Romania did this quite successfully in the last uh, rural development program where they spent, they put 116 million euro into a, into a particular guarantee instrument. And the European Investment Bank was able to give them 460 million in soft loans. So it's a no brainer really for the member states, and, uh, but it has to be included as part of the rural development program. And I know that the Department of Agriculture here will include it. So it's another, it's, it's all this, this buzzword again, new buzzwords every day, but leverage is a key word now in terms of if you have a few quid, how can you get even more money by using that money to the best possible advantage? And the European Investment Bank is now for the first time interested in supporting uh, agriculture in terms of processing, primary production, young farmers setting up, forestry, green infrastructure, storage. Uh, and uh, you know, I know that uh, Carl Fitzgerald is here who is, who is working very closely uh, with the European Investment Bank on behalf of the NTMA in order to roll out some of that on behalf of the country and hopefully that will be successful during the course of the year. There is some 7.5 billion euro available for investment in, according to the, in accordance with the, the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund. And that's the fund that the NTMA are managing on behalf of the country. And they have a statutory mandate to invest on a commercial basis to support economic activity and employment in the state. And I'm delighted that the NTMA, one of their key sectors that they're prepared to support financially is agriculture and food and, and all of the agri-tech business that we're talking about today. So there are new opportunities emerging, and the business climate is, is a bit more favourable when it comes to that. Now, we agree that ICT has the potential to turbocharge the sustainable intensification that we're working towards. So what do we do about it? What comes next on that? What we need now is for the ICT and digital industry to fully embrace this opportunity and engage with the agri-food sector. And I'm particularly pleased that Intel are interested in engaging uh, with, with all of the partners uh, in relation to that, and I want to thank them very much for that. One can argue that agriculture is the last frontier for ICT, the last undeveloped territory in which dedicated hardware and software are not driving productivity increases and economic growth. And the tech experts we need are not 10,000 miles away in some Silicon Valley fortress, uh, not the, but we want to make a Kenny Castle. Ireland is, in, in our view, of course, uh, the global technology hub of choice for the strategic business activities of ICT companies. We have a deserved reputation for being the heart of ICT in Europe. So if it doesn't happen in Ireland, it's not going to happen anywhere. So make sure we have to make sure we're ahead of the game and make sure it happens here. We have a talented workforce, we have an open economy, and we've attracted eight out of the top ten global IT companies to establish a presence here. So they are here, I'm sure, to collaborate with us, and I want to thank Intel in particular for expressing interest in joining with this particular initiative that we have discussion here today. There's a growing indigenous digital, uh, indigenous digital technology sector. This sector alone plays 30,000 people with to total sales of over 2 billion brands. So the expertise is there on both sides of the agri-tech equation. We need to start joining up the dots and working together in collaboration, as I mentioned earlier. So precision farming, smart agriculture, uh, all of these buzzwords will uh, you know, flow out, but what does it mean to the farmer what does it mean to the business is what you'll be asked about. We want to enable farmers to work smartly and more efficiently. New hardware and software systems will improve agriculture in a multitude of ways. And new smart agri-production systems will use advanced ICT. Many of you are doing it already in the, your businesses around Europe and the world. So we have, if you want to improve the quality of crop production, 
the quality of livestock health, but also the quality of life for farmers, you have to have ICT. And uh, one of the issues that I came across recently was an example of innovative thinking, the Irish Herdwatch farming app, which it helps dairy and beef farmers keep electronic records of their cattle, ensuring easy compliance and a lot of time consumption in terms of paperwork saved. And machinery and equipment become smarter, smarter and better connected. It'll improve the efficiency of agricultural inputs and outputs, and of course that will mean better bottom line for the, and marginal profitability uh, for, for the farmer. So they will also have mass data gathering capability, an innovation which holds enormous potential for the sector. So the increased presence of sensors throughout the value chain means large volumes of data can be collected, and this data can improve decision making at all points in the food chain. And it's estimated that implying sensor data could raise global yields by 10 to 20 percent. And that's how we're going to have to feed the growing middle class, but also the growing population of the world, where it's going to hit 9 million people by 2050. And the work starts now to achieve that. Sometimes, you know, people feel that we're going to get up some morning around 2050 and we're going to have 9, 9 billion people. It's not like that, uh, uh, thankfully. Uh, but we have not just an obligation in European agricultural policy to generate the sort of innovation to achieve the objectives of the European Union, but also the moral obligation and the opportunities that this provides commercially for European competitive agriculture to feed the populations of the world. And many of you are already exploring intensively all of the opportunities that this may, this may grab in the Far East and indeed in Africa. So we're entering the year of big data for precision farming, and the agri-food sector must position itself to make the most of the coming changes. We're well positioned to take a European Ireland, in my view, is very well positioned to take a European, indeed global, leadership role in the development of these new products. And I am confident that nothing less than this bold ambition will inform all of the conversations that are taking here today. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the end of milk quotas opens up a new opportunity. It's going to be short-term volatility, of course, you know, things settle down. But we have seen that before in so many sectors in the agribusiness. So we have to put an end to the silos so that we can unleash the potential uh, for the new market opportunities, the potential of ICT to transform modern agriculture and drive the sustainable intensification we need to provide even more opportunities. And I would hope that, we, uh, that the wonderful phrase in the Irish language will come to mind, which of course it means no strength without coming together. And this must be the motto of Ireland Inc in this area to drive the innovation that we need and the collaboration we need to deliver for agriculture and food and for employment opportunities on the island of Ireland. And I wish your deliberations well today. I'm privileged and proud to be associated with this particular very important collaboration. And I hope that the specialization in the agri-tech area that you're now developing today will go from strength to strength and that Ireland once again will be able to use the great strength and opportunity that it has with its skilled labour force uh, and with the coming together of so many partners in the public and private sector that we will be able again to show the populations of the European Union uh, that Ireland is able to punch above its weight and deliver in a key policy initiative for the European agriculture and the common agriculture policy where putting into practice in a very meaningful way by producing more by using less. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.